So a reminder that Science in the City <laughs> is an opportunity to join Pacific Science Center for a discussion on current science topics and research from leading local organizations that dives into topics that affect our community. Science in the City events are an opportunity to join lively conversation with scientists and experts and learn about scientific and technological achievement in topics that are relevant to our city and region. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. A reminder that if you are not already a member, these events are free, so I do encourage you guys to look at memberships with us. I think that there's a couple of you here in the audience. Um, as well, we have discounts on other events if you're a member with us. So later this week, we have Science of Spirits. Uh, it's a whiskey tasting event, 21 plus. There's discounts on tickets for that if you're a member. If you do need to leave at any time, a reminder that it's through the left-hand doors. They're camouflaged wood doors, so just make sure you push on the right one. Um, you'll head outside and then downstairs to get to the facilities. There's also water there if you need it. So maybe this is a lecture that might be of interest to some of you. This is our Halloween Science in the City event that I'm pretty excited for. This is featuring one of our science communication fellows that they've been trained in science communication, and it's Dr. Caitlin Casimo. And she'll be talking to us about the process which our bodies and mind will go through as one transforms into a werewolf. So she'll use comparative anatomy and some other things to talk about that transformation. Um, so join us on October 30th at 7 p.m., 6 p.m. if you'd like to do some trick-or-treating at the Science Center for this hair-raising talk. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, you all to Russ Bertner and Nick Kramer for their talk on storytelling through analytics. So Russ is a technical group manager for the visual analytic team at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington. With over 15 years experience, Russ has worked in HCI, software design, and vision exploration. His past work experiences include extensive product development with Microsoft, Alki Software, Disney, and Oxygen Media, where his current work areas for PNNL are in user experience, innovation, cyber, human machine teaming, immersive computing, decision support systems, collaborative, adaptive environments, and emergency response. Lux, and their bios were bigger, by the way. <laughs> so these are cut down. Um, Nick uh, joined the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as a visual analytics researcher in 2001. He received his computer science degree from Central Washington University. He has contributed as a software developer, technical lead, and project manager to a variety of interactive data visualization software products. He has guided the execution, execution of research and development of innovative new visualizations and text analysis algorithms for PNNL's Inspire product. His current work is in human machine teaming, active data, which allows a user paired with an intelligent assistant to cooperatively analyze multiple data sources together. Um, so at this time, I would love to introduce Russ to take, right, Russ, yes, because I keep calling him everything <laughs> except for Russ, <laughs> to uh, start the evening. So thank you, guys. I'm a walker talker, so I hope you're okay with me walking around a lot. Uh, let's see if I can walk and use the controller at the same time. That'll be the trick. All right, so my name is Russ. Uh, I'm a technical group manager at the lab. Uh, my background is in user experience research. Um, just a quick poll here. Uh, how many of you guys work with data? A lot of you work with data. All right, so. Uh, background in uh, visual analytics. Do you guys know what visual analytics is? One, two, three, a couple of you. Okay. Um, well, you're going to get a good idea of what visual analytics is. You're going to hear a little bit about the history, uh, and then you're going to hear about some of the vision and the future work that we're working on here at the lab. But let's start at what is the lab? So DOE runs a number of national labs all around the United States. Uh, ours is in the top left corner there, Pacific Northwest National Lab. We're a DOE lab run and operated by Battelle. Uh, it came from, yeah, it came out of the Manhattan Project. Um, it has since moved on from nuclear, although we have a very large DOE nuclear facility. Uh, we are now uh, covering all kinds of different sponsors, sponsors mainly in the government sector, from Department of Energy, DOD, uh, intelligence agencies, um, uh, a plethora of others. Uh, we are a national lab, meaning that 
or applied science. So fundamental science is science for science sake. We do publish a lot. We go to conferences, we participate in journals, but almost all of our work within uh, computing analytics, which is the division we're in, is about applied science, meaning that the things that we do are meant to uh, make an impact in the mission areas that the government's of it, the government isn't interested in. All right, visual analytics. So we uh, helped actually define what visual analytics is within the science community back in 2005 with this book called Illuminating the Path. Uh, and the definition for visual analytics is about interacting with information. It's about looking at a visualization, gaining insight, decision support from it. It's not just a picture. All right, so if you're used to using uh, Excel spreadsheets and doing pie charts and bar graphs, it's more like a pivot table in Excel than it is those sort of diagrams. All right, now there's a rich history in visual analytics or visual systems or visual information that we leverage, but for the most part, what we do is we allow a analyst to interact with data for discovery purposes. All right, so they're looking at information, they're able to look at it from different uh, attributes, they're able to work with it to actually answer questions that they're trying to answer. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about history. In this case, this is more of that, that information visualization. So some of the earliest work, one of the pieces I cut out was the cave art, right? Cave art is a good example of, of a visualization being used to actually illustrate and talk about a hunt, right? In this case, uh, the Turin maps, about 1150 BC, uh, these parchments were found, and they're actually extremely accurate in terms of what a map looks like, but it actually is encoded also with things like where uh, 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 barley was farmed, where the roads were, right? What types of buildings were in this map? And so it wasn't just you know, lines and squiggles. They actually encoded meaning behind some of these things. Another great example from about 950 BC, this is sun, moon, and planets. And so they were actually mapping in the solar system where the moon sits in accordance to where the sun and stars also fall. And this was a sketch that was found. What we haven't yet figured out is what the little marks there in the middle center part are. Um, but again, there, there, there's a lot of thought about what that could potentially encode. Relationships of knowledge. So Lou was a Spanish philosopher. Uh, and he was playing around with these illustrations to try and tell stories, right? So one of the things that visual analytics does is, is help tell a story about data or tell a story about information in a way that is more than just a spreadsheet, as an example, or a bunch of numbers. And so what we see here is this, this knowledge graph on the left, which looks like a tree, and on the far right is a circle that allowed the, the the user, if you will, to spin this circle to look at different relationships and how they would align differently from attributes of this data. This one's great. This is from William Playfair, fourth century. Economic and agriculture. And so what we see here is a graph. Let me actually make sure I get the attributes right on this one. Uh, so what we see is cost of living uh, and the average of pay mechanics, smiths, masons, and carpenters. The chart contains three layers of information. Bottommost are wages, the middle bar chart plotting the cost of wheat, and along the top, the reigning periods of the English monarchy. While some of the labeling on the chart is difficult to read, it does appear to support the gist of Playfair's assertion that on balance, mechanical workers' pay had risen faster than the price of grain. And so a lot of this was hard for people to understand until this kind of graph came out and they could actually see the data and the information and how it correlated to, to things like uh, uh, the reigning of the monarchs. Napoleon's 1812 campaign. This became really famous uh, by a gentleman, Edward Tuft, who wrote books about visualization. In this case, I love this one because it actually shows uh, temporally and spatially uh, what Napoleon's army did as it marched. And the size of the line actually shows the, how many troops there were, and you can see it as it marched down until it had to retreat how uh, uh, they got whittled away by the weather and by the, by the Russians until they actually came back and the army was just decimated in the end. This is another great one by John Snow. Uh, John Snow was trying to understand this cholera outbreak and, and he couldn't figure out, it looked very random 
when they were looking at it on a map until they actually mapped where the wells were. So the little squares are where uh, death occurred in cholera and the circles, which are harder to see, uh, there's one in the center by the really long square is where a well was. And as soon as they mapped the well next to the cholera, they realized that there was a correlation between the water source and, cho and this cholera outbreak. Well, some people don't understand that Florence Nightingale was a data magnet. She loved to play with data. And so she developed this coxcomb plot. And what she was trying to do is describe uh, how um, sanitation was extremely important to troop survival. Right? So when, when a person was injured on the field, if they didn't actually uh, have good sanitation principles, the, the rate of death was higher. So what you see on this coxcomb plot, the red, is deaths from wounds, the black is deaths from all other causes, and the blue is deaths from, I can't read it from here, uh, uh, other causes and times. So as you go left to right, as you increase the sanitation, deaths from other causes uh, went down. All right, now we're starting to get into computers. So in the 1960s, Harvard, you get Harvard, do you remember the old uh, dot makers, printers? Right? So they actually did visualizations that used dot matrix printers, and they did all the states. And what they were doing is using different characters on that dot matrix printer to actually show different types of layers. So imagine, you know, on Google Earth, you can turn on and off weather, you can turn on and off elevation. They were literally doing it on a dot matrix printer and turning on and off these types of layers to see uh, different things like soil erosion to uh, uh, water, I mean, all kinds of really cool stuff. Uh, so if you've taken computer science and you've done data science recently, this probably won't be new to anybody that has taken that, but this is ANSCOM's quartet. And so when you look at data, sometimes when you're looking at a cell spreadsheet and you're comparing data sets to each other, when you're looking at, at a rows and columns, they look very similar to each other until you actually plot them, and then you actually see these different patterns will emerge. All right, so when you're looking at the data, it was hard to actually tell how it was different. But as soon as you put it on a plot, you can see these different patterns, and then you can obviously see uh, that they do diverge, and they are unique. VizCalc to Excel, all right? So the land of Microsoft. Uh, VizCalc was one of the first uh, data programs uh, and then um, MultiPlan was Microsoft's answer uh, to compete with that, which then later became Excel. Uh, and now Excel is, is one of the, the chief ways that a lot of people do data, uh, uh, data entry, data understanding, and in some ways data analytics, especially when you start looking at pivot tables or some of the new interactive visualizations that Microsoft now has in business intelligence suites. Uh, so this is the cartographic data visualization, or visualizer. This starts to show new techniques that we still leverage today. So comparing different data sets, uh, changing the visualization in a way that you can see from different attributes, and then something called selection scrubbing, where if you select one node in, in one visualization, it actually shows where it correlates and how it works across all the other visualizations. We do this a lot today in our our current visualization techniques where you're able to look at it on a map or on a timeline or, or in different sort of data views and you can click it and actually see where that, that data exists across these different views. Oh, there's a typo on Inspire. So Inspire with just one S uh, is a visualization tool that we developed at the lab using a galaxy. So it's kind of hard to see because it's dark. Uh, but this is looking at text, and so you can basically ingest any sort of text source, different documents. The different dots that you see or barely can see are those documents. Uh, we have analytics that then uh, ingest the text in it. You don't, the human doesn't describe what the text is. The analytics actually look for correlating terms. Those correlating terms become descriptors, and the descriptors are the white text that you can just barely see here, which then allows the user, the, the analyst, to see groupings of these documents based on those terms. All right, so the X and Y axis doesn't mean anything, but how close the dots are to each other means that those terms or those documents are very similar based on that term. All right, so imagine you have to look at 150,000 documents. 
right? And your job is to tell uh, uh, your, your, your sponsor what's in it, and you've got 15 minutes to do it, right? Are you gonna be able to read 150,000 documents even if they're a paragraph at a time? No. Now imagine doing that on four or five page documents, right? That's what our analysts are asked about all the time, especially in the government sector. What is in this content? I need to know in the next 30 minutes. So visualization tools like this give them an understanding of what's in this data without having to read it all. What they do is get an understanding and then they can click into things and read based on interest. All right, so visual analytics at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. In the next three years to five years, we're focused on uh, six key areas. So I just turned it off. All right, there we go. Text and media. So I talked a little bit about that with Inspire. Uh, our sponsors come to us with really interesting different types of data. And the problems that they have in them are, are extremely complex. We take for granted that when you search for Bill Gates on Google, you will get images of Bill Gates. You will get videos of Bill Gates. You will get text documents of Bill Gates. Well, the reason why that exists is because Google has spent a lot of time correlating Bill Gates to this information. Right? In this case, with the government, we're looking for things that aren't as routinely defined as like Bill Gates. Right? We're looking for known terrorists. We're looking for uh, information that we're not normally interested in. Right? We're looking for outliers of data. In the Department of Energy space, we're looking for things that, that cause power failures. And so when we're doing a look, a search for images, right, we're looking for images that are similar to each other in a way that's about uh, sampling uh, interesting artifacts. Right? So on the top, uh, this system is looking at uh, open source data that's streaming. Right? So you can imagine uh, uh, social media as an example. Right? Social media coming at a, a, a user yourselves right, is like Niagara Falls. It is a lot of data streaming at you at any one point in time. There's so much data you can't capture it, let alone understand it or read it. Right? Meaning that humans can understand about a teaspoon at a time. Right? And you got Niagara Falls coming down in front of you. You're going to hold out a teaspoon, and you're going to come back out and say, this is what's in Niagara Falls. Right? How accurate is that? Mm -hmm. right? It's a very small stream in Niagara Falls. And it's a small sample of that time. Right? Is that accurate, that this is what's in Niagara Falls? You guys are killing me. Did I already put you to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, it's very, very difficult. But if we can visualize and understand that information, we're not looking at Niagara Falls and streams, we're looking at Niagara Falls in terms of the visualization or images or, or representations of data. Graph and network is about understanding relationships. Uh, so in a cyber case, it's what computers are related to other computers? What events are existing across these computers? What attacks are currently happening? When a DOS attack exists, how do we isolate those systems because that DOS attack is occurring? Right, when we're looking at uh, uh, people, for example, who knows who, how do they know each other? Right, when we're looking at knowledge, how do these pieces of knowledge relate to each other? Right, all of this is graph when you talk about relationships. This gets more and more complex when you, in when you input time on top of that. Because right, topics drift, relationships change, nodes disappear and they turn back on again. Imagine looking at a computer network of 20,000 computers, right, and half of those nodes turn off and then they turn back on over the weekend. They turn back off again. And you can't find those nodes, and does that mean they don't exist, or does it just mean they're not currently on? Predictive situation awareness. So situation awareness is about understanding current state and status of any given situation. So in the case of Department of Homeland Security, it's looking at events after a hurricane. Right? What's the current state of the roads? How much you know, can we get access to where people are? Uh, where are the resources? How do I get water to these people? Right? In case of DOE, it's trying to understand uh, where the power lines are, what's, what's currently being generated. Right? If you think about wind turbines versus hydro versus nuclear, right? when do you use wind? When it's windy. Right? When do you use nuclear? Well, when the wind dies down. Right? When do you use the dams? Well, you use the dams when there's enough water stored behind it that you can use that battery source. All right, so you have to sort of understand that situation about when that ebb and flow occurs, and then you put the interesting dynamic of a financial model on top of it. 
The top one's kind of interesting. This is uh, biofeeds. So this is looking at uh, biofeeds from around the world and trying to understand how uh, uh, epidemics can affect uh, troop readiness. Human machine teaming. So remember when I was talking about uh, humans only understand a teaspoon at a time. Right? We're at an age where artificial intelligence is being thrown around in commercials all the time. Right? Machine learning. Right? The truth is, artificial intelligence is coming. It's here in a lot of ways. If you use Amazon, you use Facebook, you do any shopping anymore, there's some, some form of artificial intelligence and machine learning that's behind it that's recommending different products to you. Right? The trick is trying to get the trust back into the user. All right, so right now we use visualization tools to represent and give decision support to an analyst. All right, and they can look at those visualizations and look at the data to actually verify that what they're finding is accurate or not. In artificial intelligence and machine learning, that is very, very difficult because the stacks are so deep and the math is so complicated, humans don't understand the math. All right, so if you guys heard of Watson, Right, so Watson was the Jeopardy king, right now it's being deployed all over the place as an answer for machine learning. And analysts are asking it questions, and Watson comes back with an answer of 42. Right? And I don't know why. But that 42 is a decision, and I have to use that as a, as a fact. And you can't. You have to be able to explain why that answer is 42. Because right? that decision, whatever it may be, may be something you can't revert back from. And so I need to be able to refute that answer of 42, or I need to be able to confirm that answer of 42. And so explainable AI is a lot about what this human machine teaming is doing. Right? Uh, so the top, actually the bottom one's interesting, this is called Sharksword. And so what it does is it, it, it inputs a bunch of images and allows the human to group those images based on classifiers that they find interesting. Right? So these are, looks like stereos. These are unicorns, these are elephants. Now find the other things that look like that. Right? And then it moves those clusters closer and then you're able to basically, just like sorting images, say this is not unicorns, this is unicorns. Right? So one of the places we're using this right now is in uh, breast cancer. Right? So we're actually able to build these classifiers around breast cancer because the doctor's able to quickly sort these images and say this is that type, this is that type. Now look for other images that are similar. And they're able to sort and move. Right? So when you're building classifiers in human machine learning, it usually takes thousands and thousands and thousands of images to actually build a good classifier. But here, we're able to do it on fewer data sets because we're able to quickly do compare and contrast that the human's really good at and say it's not this, it is this. And so for, uh, for hundreds instead of thousands, we're able to actually start building pretty accurate classifiers. Cognitive modeling. This one gets really stretchy. So, Cognitive modeling is about understanding the human in ways that's beyond an observation. Right? So in user experience, typically what I do is I go out and I watch humans. I watch how they work the systems. That tells me a lot about how uh, what the utility or usability of a system is. In the case of cognitive modeling, we're developing ways of measuring human cognition that isn't about observation. Right? We have uh, uh, sensors that we can put on our arms. We have respiration, perspiration, uh, heartbeat, right? We measure pupil dilation. We can measure when you lean forward in a chair or lean back in a chair, right? We have the little brain helmets that are actually measuring when, when things get exciting in your head and spark, right? If we can actually tell through these sensors when insight occurs, I can change a visualization before you click on a mouse. Right? You're interested in this, let me show you more of that. Right? Or the reverse. Right? When you're tired, there's cognitive depletion. Right? I can remove interruptions because you're no longer sparking. You're no longer interesting or interested. You're leaning back. You're, you're overwhelmed. Right? How do I get you back engaged in the interface? Immersive computing. So this goes towards computing in general, right? We are at the cusp of a fundamental shift in the way people use computers, right? When I first taught my kids how to use a computer uh, 12 years ago, it was mouse and keyboard based, right? It taught them a little bit to figure out what pixel precision meant, what it meant to type on a keyboard. How are we doing time-wise, Dave? Okay. Uh, how, to, how to use a keyboard and how to use a mouse, right? 
Now, Nick taught his kids how to use an iPad, right, which wasn't that long ago. He just gave the iPad to them. You didn't have to train them how to use the system. Right? The way computers are shifting are becoming more and more human-like, right? which is why human-machine teaming is important. Right? If we can teach a computer to be more human, it can interact with us more like a human, and artificial intelligence then gains more value. Right? But when we're thinking about how people use computers, it's moving beyond mouse and keyboard. It's moving beyond touch. Right? It's moving beyond now voice and audio. Right? We're doing some really interesting research with Alexa and some of the other audio interfaces. Right? Visual analytics. I'm using an Alexa. Right? What is visual when I'm talking to data? Right? The discourse is changing from a conversation or into a conversation as opposed to me just reading and understanding. I'm actually able to ask questions and it's responding, just like Jarvis does. Now, when you move that and combine that touch, gesture, voice into virtual reality and augmented reality, now you've got something that's really compelling, really interesting. Right? We're breaking down the square rectangle, that flat interface where you're sitting in front of a desktop. We're now looking at it where you're fully immersed in information. And it's not just about looking at a galaxy. You're in the galaxy, and you're able to reach out to the stars. You're clicking one here, and you're clicking one there, and you're actually understanding the relationships between these data sets through route guidance of a star system. Right? Really fascinating work here, which is why I brought Nick. Right? So Nick is my engineer that can actually talk down to that technical level about what immersive computing is. All right, thanks, Russ. Uh, all right, so uh, like Russ said, I, I specialize a bit more in virtual reality. I've, I've been involved in visual analytics research and development for quite a while, and uh, sort of found a, a, a new interest in this particular technology. And it's really up and coming. Uh, over the last few years, it's, it's uh, a lot of virtual reality hardware has been become readily available to everyday consumers. It's moved out of laboratories and being very expensive to something that's much more accessible uh, and uh, purchasable. I mean, you can go on Amazon right now and buy a VR headset, uh, no problem. Uh, so uh, at PNNL, we're trying to take advantage of this uh, technology being readily available and figure out how to apply it to some of the go uh, government mission spaces. And so and if you're not familiar with uh, virtual reality technology, uh, here's a couple of examples of, of hardware that's available. We've got some of these that you can try out after, after the talk here. Uh, there are a couple classes of headsets. So there are headsets uh, that are considered tethered headsets. They uh, hook up to a large computer, high-end graphics. Uh, they're, they're really uh, great looking graphics, highly immersive, uh, a great interaction where you can reach out and grab and, and walk around uh, inside of a virtual world. Uh, the downside is they're a little bit more expensive. Uh, there's also a class of headsets that are, that are based on mobile phone technologies uh, or considered standalone headsets. They're, uh, they're much lighter weight, uh, cheaper, much more portable, uh, and easy to set up and use. Now, the graphics aren't quite as good. They're not as interactive, um, but it's you know, cheap and easy to get access to. So uh, at PNNL, we've been working across all these different hardware sets, applying them for different purposes. So the industry that's built up around this technology is really uh, focused on gaming and entertainment primarily. So these are uh, on these systems you can buy them, and you're playing a lot of video games, or you're we're watching and engaging with media primarily. Um, and there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, infrastructure to build out that ecosystem that's developed around it from the gaming industry. You've got uh, a computer game engine that allows software engineers and developers to build these experiences. Um, and so between that hardware and that software ecosystem, we're able to leverage sort of the billions of dollars that the entertainment industry has invested in this. And we can use those technologies towards mission areas that are applicable to PNNL. And so that would be things like uh, science and education. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples where we've applied uh, this technology to science and education. 
All right, so one example is uh, related to visualizing molecules. Uh, and uh, I've worked on uh, this uh, software, it's called the Unity Mole. Uh, it allows you to uh, explore and see the information about a, a molecule. It could be a protein, um, something where you can see the individual atoms and bonds that make up the molecule. We worked in partnership with a research group in Paris. Uh, they originally developed this software and it ran on a, a desktop. So relating back to what Russ was saying, you'd use a mouse and keyboard, you'd spin this molecule around, you'd look at it to start to understand its structure and some data about it. So we worked with them to bring their software into virtual reality. So now you can put on a headset, you can see in 3D, and you can just walk around this molecule. It's now bigger, you know, much bigger than life size, and you can walk around and see the individual atoms and bonds that make up this molecule. So I've got a couple of videos that show what this is like, and uh, we've actually been able to take uh, and partner with uh, Pinanel Chemists to uh, have them see and visualize their science, the molecules they might be designing in a laboratory or modeling on a supercomputer. They can now see what that's like uh, and just put on a headset and walk around and look at, look at their chemistry happening. Uh, so you can do things like uh, look at the molecular dynamics, the motion that happens in a molecule. And so in this particular case, uh, what you see in the center there are those two red dots. Those uh, represent uh, 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 a hydrogen atom where, uh, I'll play that again. Uh, they're actually an, an H2 molecule uh, is inside of this, this larger molecule, and that, that molecule causes those, those, H, uh, those hydrogen molecules to pull apart. All right, and so we're working on, in, in uh, chemistry for energy uh, uh, use cases, uh, being able to produce hydrogen much more efficiently. And so this shows uh, that chemistry happening in, in molecules that are unique and have been designed at PNML. And somebody can get in and, and kind of look at what's going on there. So here's another example, a much larger molecule, this big protein in this case. Uh, in VR, you can put in a headset and you can have sort of a, a palette of options where you can change how you look at the molecule. You can, uh, instead of looking at the individual atoms and bonds, you might look at the, the larger structures that are going on uh, in the molecule. You might uh, look at the uh, electromagnetic magne uh, magnetic field surrounding the, the molecule, the positive and negative charges uh, that are associated with that. And these are things that can help uh, chemists or biologists understand how this uh, particular molecule might, might interact with other molecules uh, uh, related to this, the science that they're doing. Uh, you can also, uh, through this interface, go in and say, I want to be a particular atom, all right? And you can turn that on and you can say, I want to be that atom, and you can point at it in the molecule, and then you can go uh, play uh, one of these molecular dynamics simulations and see how that molecule moves, and you can see how it moves relative to a particular atom that you, you get to be, and you see this thing moving and, and bouncing around around you, and that can help them better understand what's going on. You could also uh, pick to be a, an electron, and you can see how that electron would move through this molecule and be, be transferred across it. And so you can, sort of like a video, you can, you can be uh, animated through this molecule to see what path it might follow. So that's an example of some work we've done in, in virtual reality that's science related. Uh, so I want to cover in, in more depth something we've done uh, recently that's, that's education related. Uh, so we, we recently did some work in collaboration with uh, uh, a group we have at PNNL that does uh, STEM, uh, science education uh, outreach in our community. Uh, they partner with teachers, they partner with school districts, uh, helping them bring new science concepts, teach the teachers about them, and then they can deliver those to students. Uh, Washington State recently adopted a new standard for computer science uh, where they want to teach uh, kids as young as uh, kindergarten about computer science concepts. And at first I thought, oh, that's crazy. How are you going to teach a, a kindergartner about computer science? Um, but uh, they've, they've got this standard worked out where the, you know, there are really early concepts that you can deliver to someone even that young. 
So what we wanted to do uh, in collaboration with this group was create a VR experience that would that would create something that's really engaging and interesting to teach particular computer science concepts to um, to uh, sort of that target audience of K through 12. And so uh, we went through uh, kind of our design process, and I want to walk you through a little bit about what that was like to go from our early ideas to a finished uh, app that you could you could play in virtual reality that delivered on uh, educating somebody on one of these computer science concepts. Uh, so the Actually, like coding up the app, uh, I found to be sort of the easy part. Uh, it's actually generating the idea and understanding what concepts you want to deliver to those students that's the hard part. Um, uh, so we found that uh, working through some of these early questions about what do you want to uh, deliver to the, the person that, that you're trying to teach a new concept to, how's, how are they going to play through that experience to gain that, like, uh, uh, interactive learning experience. What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? Those are some of the questions that we find you, you want to uh, ask and answer early on before you actually write any lines of code to build the app. So for this, uh, this, ex uh, this project, what we started with was this, this table. Uh, so it's kind of an eye chart, but uh, what it uh, represents is this computer science standard uh, for this K through 12. The vertical columns represent age bands. So on the far left, you've got you know, kindergarten, first grade, or early elementary school. And as you move towards the right, you move into, into a high school time frame. Uh, across uh, the rows, you've got uh, computer science topics. So you've got things starting with uh, uh, hardware. Uh, you've got networks and the internet. Uh, you've got cybersecurity, programming concepts. Uh, things like that. And each of the cells represent a specific concept they want to deliver to that age band in that top topic area uh, for, for students. And so this was produced and basically said, hey, teachers, you're going you're gonna to now teach computer science. Good luck. <laughs> and so we wanted to, you know, provide our little part to help with that. Uh, and so we looked at this and we started saying, well, you know, uh, 2B or you know, 1A, we could, we could maybe imagine a virtual reality experience around that that would help teach one of those concepts uh, to students at a, at a given age level. So we pulled out some uh, particular ones, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is around uh, networking and cybersecurity, and, uh, and a couple very specific concepts that we wanted to be able to deliver to students and have them learn. So we identified these and we said, oh, we can kind of imagine a, a VR experience around this. So that was some of that early brainstorming that we did. From there, we started to envision what specifically this experience might, might be like, might feel like. And so we developed, uh, you know, selected sort of images and inspirational art off the internet uh, and a lot of just sort of discussions and, and brainstorming around that. And we'd gather up pictures like this to inspire what we wanted to do. We specifically wanted to focus on uh, teaching students about how information is broken down into packets and move across a network and reassembled at their destination. And we envision that being maybe something like um, packages getting delivered through the mail, or uh, if you've seen the, the movie uh, Inside Out, you've got memories that are stored and, and moved around. Uh, we liked uh, some of these bright, you know, factories uh, or, uh, uh, you know, piping systems. You can imagine that as a metaphor for a more abstract concept of information being broken down into packets and reassembled at their destination. So we thought the user could maybe be involved in a, in a process like this. Uh, from those early ideas, then we started figuring out, well, how are we going to design and, and build this thing? And so we use uh, tools to create uh, 3D models of our environment and, and uh, start to do some early prototyping of how we're actually going to realize this uh, VR app. And so uh, one of the things, so the specific way we, we kind of no narrowed in on was these, these boxes coming in on conveyor belts. I would be able to grab them off the conveyor belt representing some packet of information. It would be color coded and I'd move it over to some outbound uh, conveyor belt, and I, I, I would be the router. I would, I would be the technology that's moving packets from some incoming source out to its destination. And so we had to, we had to figure out how that was actually going to be coded up. Uh, so part of that was leveraging some of this computer game engine technology, uh, and we actually uh, 
we, we started with some real early prototypes where boxes would appear and they would uh, have physics associated with them. They would land on this conveyor belt. The conveyor belt would sort of animate them towards you. Uh, if you didn't pick them up, they'd just fall on the floor. Uh, if, you, if you grabbed onto them, you could toss them on that outbound conveyor belt. They'd, they'd land on that conveyor belt and they'd animate out of the, uh, the scene. And so we expanded on that. We started to design a, a central hub where they imagined the user would be and they would have these conveyor belts sort of surrounding them, all around them that they could interact with. Uh, then we did, uh, started working on what is the larger environment that they're going to be in when they're moving these boxes across conveyor belts. Uh, so part of uh, the process involved there is uh, uh, sometimes we utilize uh, 3D models that are available on the internet. Artists build them and, and distribute them. You can buy them. And so we, uh, we purchased this, this warehouse environment. So we wanted to put that user in that setting. We started to apply some colors and and uh, you know, make it bright and vivid like our, our original artwork that we uh, were interested in. Uh, we did some other uh, sketches to, to show exactly what uh, uh, the, uh, the boxes moving on these conveyor belts would look like. So a real rough uh, sort of initial look of how the environment could, could be for the user. Um, so we also wanted to pay attention to uh, the color coding. So we imagined packages coming in were color coded based on the destination that they needed to go to. And uh, we wanted to be kind of uh, pay attention to, to maybe people that were colorblind. And so uh, our team has uh, graphic designers. And so we asked them to come up with a color palette that would be friendly to people that were colorblind. Uh, and then they came up with the ideas of, of also adding uh, icons to these. So you'd all have a, a little bit more information encoded there so you could decide where that package needed to go. So that color palette then got applied to that scene and it, and it started to get a little more uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing as well as more, more usable by a broader audience. And so we ended up modeling our packages with those icons that were designed out and applying those colors to them. Uh, it may look a little bit like the elements in the Fifth Element movie, if you've seen that. So, we, you know, we started with that original environment, those bright colors that were just sort of randomly picked by a software developer. We uh, got input from our graphic designers and we applied that to the environment. We set some nice mood lighting and, and baked our textures. And uh, so we went from that original environment to something that was much more polished. Uh, and pleasant and, and also very usable. So that was sort of the before and after. Uh, we also wanted the user to be able to pick up packages and, uh, and uh, sort of maybe suck them up and then uh, shoot them out uh, to some outbound conveyor belt. So we had our graphic artists uh, draw up, and actually these are, these are Russ's drawings. Uh, you know, he did uh, paper and pen sketches, stuff on his whiteboard, he colorized them. Uh, lots of different, uh, you know, possible options, and we ended up settling on uh, this sort of vacuum gun, we call it. Uh, it's got a little storage chamber on the side, it's got some informational displays on it, and it's got a, a vacuum on the front of it. And so that went from uh, sketches on Russ's whiteboard, being scanned to the computer and colorized, to some 3D modeling in, uh, in a program called Maya, uh, to a final rendering that actually went into the, the final game that we made. And so that's the, the final vacuum gun that you use to interact with the boxes that are coming at you. Uh, so as part of this experience, we also not only wanted to teach them about networks and packets and how that, uh, uh, they transfer data across them, we also wanted to show them uh, some cybersecurity concepts. So we settled on uh, explaining some things about viruses and uh, denial of service attacks, and then uh, giving the, the, the player the ability to have countermeasures, uh, to have defenses they could put up, which is another side to, to cybersecurity. Uh, and so we wanted to figure out how to visualize those. So again, we went back to our graphic artist, Russ. He did some, some concept sketches, and we were thinking about antivirus being something like an x-ray scanner and uh, uh, deploying a firewall on your network as, as being a, a walled gate. And so those were uh, ideas that, we, that, that Russ came up with. And then those went back into our software development team and uh, we uh, ended up uh, uh, creating our firewall as an actual wall of fire. 
which was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a, a scanner one there uh, to represent our antivirus. So those were, you know, a really uh, nice collaborative process working with our graphic designers, our software engineers, our 3D modelers, uh, and our educators uh, and cybersecurity experts. So kind of all come together and decide how we're going to deliver on, uh, you know, a fun, interactive, cool experience to, to teach uh, kids uh, about uh, networking and cybersecurity. So I'm going to show you how it ended up. And we've got, a, got this here if uh, you guys want to try it out. This is sort of our final product. I'll let you watch a little bit and, and see what it looks like. Tell you right now, this game gets really stressful really quickly. <laughs> we also introduced the concept of Wi Fi as these boxes that would fly in at you. It's a full 360 experience. That's part of what makes it so darn stressful. And if you look down at your feet, you see all the boxes you've missed. You see piling up around you. All right, so you, I think you get the idea. Um, so in, in, in closing, uh, at least for this portion, uh, uh, I originally got exposed to virtual reality technology right here in Seattle. You know, I, I live in southeastern Washington, but uh, uh, we have some staff that are up here in the Seattle area, right up here on Dexter. Um, uh, and there, there were, one of our staff there had a connection to a VR startup company here in, in Seattle. This is back in uh, late 2015. I got a chance to come up here, go visit their startup company, and they had some really early headsets, VR headsets that they, they'd gotten. And I got to try them there for the first time, and one of them was called the HTC Vive. And the unique thing about it is it, has, it was the first headset that had these two motion controllers where you could reach out and grab and interact with the virtual world. And uh, I got to try that, and I got to use this VR painting app called Tilt Brush where you can do a 3D painting all around you. Um, and uh, when I tried that and I could actually interact with the 3D world in a very natural way, I said, well, I, I've done interactive data visualization on desktop and laptop computers for years. This is like a game changer. This is interactive in 3D. We got to be doing this at PNNL. And so I got my first exposure here in Seattle, and now we've continued to do that for the last couple of years, and we've got some fun work that we're doing at PNNL based on this. Um, but in those two years, I've seen the technology go from like these early prototypes that were available on Kickstarter and and companies started to release them, and now it's, it's a, getting to be a pretty good sized industry and a lot of hardware available. And you can see where it's going a bit. Um, so there's some of the stuff's a little clunky still, uh, but I think the hardware is gonna improve a lot. And eventually, uh, it's probably gonna be the norm to have a computing environment that's all around you all the time, where you're wearing some sort of futuristic glasses, um, it's inevitably gonna happen, I think. And so I'm really excited to you know, be in these sort of early stages working on it and curious to see uh, where it all goes next and what all you get to experience in the future. Hopefully we're contributing to some of that. Um, so that's, that's what I've got to say about virtual reality.
So when we're thinking about virtual reality, immersive computing, immersive analytics, storytelling in general, I mean, a lot of the education that he was talking about was telling a story, teaching the story about what cybersecurity looks like. The visualization he showed with the molecule allows the, the, the analyst and the chemist to actually tell a story about what is going on in this molecule. Right, so when we're referring to visual analytics and visualizations in general, it isn't just an illustration. It's about interacting and answering questions and being able to relate and tell a story for the decision-making process. Uh, so at this time, we're more than welcome to take questions. We've also got that game you just saw. You can come play. But questions first. Discussion. Any of that. Uh, you guys talked about how you had to adjust the graphics in case someone was colorblind and accessibility across a broad spectrum, something you consider before you uh, finalize the visualization. So the question was around accessibility uh, and how and what and what role that plays in the visualization. Mm -hmm. Alright, so uh, my background is user experience and graphics and uh, accessibility is a huge role. Um, the choice of color uh, especially when you're talking about a heat map or a color spectrum, is incredibly important if you don't double encode, right? So if you remember those blocks, we put the patterns on top, right? Because the different types of color blindness, we can't actually do all of them fixed at all. So if you double encode with a pattern or a, a, a glyph, right, that, that actually helps with those colors. Uh, so yes, accessibility plays a very, very strong role. Uh, in, in visualization, actually in, in information work in general. Microsoft spends a fortune on doing accessibility across their suites, and, and we are comparable. A lot of times some of our tools are very prototype, and so then when they release them to our users or our analysts, it's usually released to, like, to five or six people. And so we go out and we talk to those five or six and see, is there any uh, deficiencies, right, or any accessibility things we need to think about? And so sometimes we can just sort of not do it because we're just answering that, that pilot that question, if you will. But when we go on the bigger spectrum for larger enterprise type systems, accessibility does play a role. Great question. So, uh, you mentioned the topic at the beginning. Um, one of the topics he brings up is uh, data to any ratio, and VR seems almost kind of a departure from that scarcity that Google represents. What do you think about, about that? How does that play a role? That's a very advanced question. All right, so uh, he, uh, you asked about Tufty and uh, the, the ink to sparsity. The data ink ratio. Data ink ratio, right? So, so Tufty believed that the less ink to tell the story, the better, right? To keep it simple, stupid, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, when we start getting, and then it went towards virtual reality and augmented reality and how that sort of breaks down. Uh, especially in augmented reality, that's gonna be a real problem, right? Because when you're augmented reality, you're looking at the reality and the overlaying data or information or visualizations on top of reality. So already when I look out at you, there is no sparsity. There is all kinds of color, all kinds of texture, all kinds of movement, and now I'm gonna overlay data and information on top of it, right? So it breaks those kinds of rules, but when you start thinking about the opportunities of what that information could do, right? I can actually blend out the background because you and I are talking, and I can just silo it just you so I don't see everybody else. And then I can bring up information about the last correspondence that you and I had, right? Our, our similar likes and dislikes, right? We put up word clouds around things that are common in social media that we have, maybe. Um, but yeah, it does break Tufty's rules, uh, but it also breaks down that square rectangle that Tufty was looking at when he was talking about those rules. I, I can comment, I guess. I, I do think it is a major challenge. Um, you're, you're still in charge of every pixel, right? So you are making that decision about data ink ratio, even in VR. Um, there's other, I'd say, maybe more serious, uh, in particular when you're doing data visualization in VR, other more serious challenges having to do with overplotting, things like that. Um, I think you can still follow a lot of those principles. Uh, it can be harder though because it's it's very natural to want to put the user in a place, in a setting, and it also helps 
when you're wearing a headset, you're, you know, you're really closed off. To, so to have, be surrounded by some natural environment, you want to populate that world, that virtual world. Um, and then if you're putting uh, the ink on top of that, you, know, you start to kind of break those rules for sure. <laughs> I have a comment about that. Sure. Um, in the area of, of social science and general and political science in particular, one of the things that captured my interest in this talk was some data visualization that is in the current issue of Technology Review, which is talking about the political situation in the country and then how visualization of it, and then really sophisticated multi-access to that data can actually bring people together in consensus. There's some fabulous articles in, in the current technology review, some beautiful pictures, and it's in the social science, political science area. Very cool. Great example. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick comment. So, my work in virtual reality, you know, obviously requires resources for us to make something. Uh, we we did focus on the computer science standards and, and built a couple things around that. We've also been doing some things related to climate science recently. Not quite ready to show, um, but uh, you know, some potential for some impact. So, those are areas where we've had resources to do some work. Um, I've certainly read and seen work, particularly in VR. Um, related to historical preservation. Um, you get 3D scans, LiDAR scans of historic sites, ancient ruins um, that are you know, maybe getting not well taken care of and they can sort of digitally um, capture those and then you can go explore them without causing any harm in virtual reality. Um, there's some really just generally some really amazing apps for going out and exploring the world uh, the whole world. <laughs> uh, if you've tried, ever tried Google Earth VR, it's freaking amazing. Uh, it's just, you can go anywhere in the world um, and, and see what's going on. It's pretty cool. I have a comment to that, too, because they reminded me. Sure. sure. Uh, with the recent, uh, right, there's a museum, and I'm going to forget which country that it burned down in, but the recent loss of all that, was it Brazil? Um, that, and I've seen it happen in other places where the museums will actually have digitization of a lot of the artifacts themselves already, but they'll actually crowdsource uh, photos that people have taken of them because in the day you can digitally recreate them in a 3D space mm -hmm. that still preserves the artifact, but in a digital instead of a, because we've lost them at this point, but we also have still data. So it's kind of cool. That might be something to look into if you're interested. Sorry, comment up. I'm not a scientist, but my concern is about the political and the economic work for you guys. As I, I read in the news, it's talking about science being defunded and scientists leaving the field because it's so discouraging right now in the U.S. And that we're losing the resources that your teams have, or in science, in uh, weather, climate, or whatever, that they're just going away. Will those people come back when we finally get to the reality of what the world is? <laughs> I mean, will they go out and do something in the private sector and then say, yeah, I need to go back now. I had to take a break for two years. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I do, you know, as people living in <laughs> So this, this is a kind of a tough one being a DOE contractor. <laughs> uh, I, I share your same concerns. Um, as everyone knows, the political climate is changes every two to four years, right? And how it changes in another two years or how it changes in this November will change basically 
this sort of focus areas that we have. Uh, at the lab, uh, we have a very diversity, uh, diverse portfolio. So when things get cut in certain areas, they tend to get more funded in other areas. And so our scientists tend to sort of float to where the funding goes to, and we're able to retain talent because of that. Um, in terms of what talent is leaving and coming back, we're in a global situation, a global economy, right? And even if you look at, say, Microsoft, right? Microsoft, Microsoft Research used to be Redmond focused a long time ago, and now it's worldwide, right? And that means the IP that's generated by Microsoft is no longer US, right? It's worldwide IP. But that IP is still utilized by mankind. So we may lose some scientists and they may come back and they may be doing science somewhere else. That science that comes out of it still can be leveraged by mankind. That's a nice political way of <laughs> uh, dodging a very, very scary problem. Yeah. You need both. Uh, yeah, so some, uh, a question about Unity Mall. Can you use it? How much computational power does it use? Uh, some of its capabilities, I guess, is the question. Um, so, like I said, we work on Unity Mall in partnership with a research group in Paris. They originally developed it, runs on a laptop. You can go download it for free. Go to search Google, Unity Mall. You can download it and install it and try it out. Wow. Um, we're current, so the, the virtual reality version, it's kind of a prototype. Um, we've had some p and chemists working with it, giving some feedback. I wouldn't say there's, it's yet mature enough uh, and offers enough to say we've discovered a new drug because of it or something of that nature. It's uh, too early, I'd say, for that type of success. Um, the, the, the partnership team that we're working with does have plans to release a virtual reality version uh, that people would be able to download for free. And uh, like I said, this hardware is readily available. You could run it at your house at some point, but even right now, you can certainly download the software and uh, run it on a laptop. Um, we brought it. Sh shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> come down from library. <laughs> um, yeah, so is that? Yeah, kind of. I was just, well, then for example, if I want to swap out a piece of protein with, uh, uh, let's say, twenty five. Okay. How do I know how, how to change the protein structure? Can, can, can your program tell and how uh, to change the interaction between the mice? So, so I don't... Except for like a, 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 a ligand bind to a receptor and how to So I'm a software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so what you said is definitely over my head. Uh, and I, but from what you said, I also don't think that that particular software is capable of doing what you described. There may be other systems that are, but not this one in particular, I suspect. Uh, yeah, I, I, write, I help write code, but I work with chemists that know what the heck you just said. <laughs> I'm happy to put you in touch with them. <laughs> Sure. Instead, you know, think of, you know, go to the uh, meeting compound library and see on the cell base app, and you, you can you know, get the principle down and do it in a very short text. And you can get you in touch with <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Uh, VR headsets can be a very individual experience and kind of trap you in your own world. I'm wondering if you could describe. When you went into the classrooms, how it got deployed with 28 students all at the same time, many of whom don't like to sit at the desk and kind of like to move around. 
So we're not, not to that point yet. Uh, so we have a pilot group of about 10 teachers that we're working with on some of these apps. Uh, we literally just last month finished our first version. It's even something we put out there that somebody could try. So that's our next step. Um, we're definitely looking for their feedback on how to incorporate this in the classroom, what's effective. Um, it, it can be kind of an isolating experience, and we certainly realize that. Um, I've read some information on different workflows. People have tried to incorporate it in a classroom, maybe setting up a station where students rotate into it, but there's other parts of a bigger lesson that are going on. Um, there might be something they experience in virtual reality and then they go back and are working on using maybe more traditional materials that complement that. Um, so a lot of uh, work still to be done there to figure it out. I also read some articles reflecting it back on other technologies in the past that have been introduced to classrooms. Um, and I was, I was just actually asking my wife, well, what, what was your access like to computers when you were in high school? And she said, well, you know, I learned to type on a typewriter. Uh, and I'm like, well, we at least had a computer lab. She's a couple years older than me. Uh, <laughs> like, even those two years made, seemed to have made a difference. And I talked to other students where, you know, a computer would be carted into their room at, at one point in time, and students would rotate in and use it. Uh, it was a more limited resource. And so we might see that for virtual reality in these early days, and maybe eventually it's, you know, maybe some classrooms, every kid's got a Chromebook now. Uh, maybe everybody will have a pair of those fancy glasses. And maybe it won't be as isolated. Maybe it'll very, very much be a multi-user experience. And maybe you're not even physically co-located anymore. Maybe it's all virtual. Uh, who knows? It's ready player one. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that you asked was, uh, you know, how do we cater to different types of people when you're looking at devices like this? All right, so as a user experience person, that's exactly the kind of questions I love to answer. All right, so I love to do the user research to try and figure out what are the different types of people and how do they learn differently using different types of devices? And then how do we change that so it works to their style, their type? All right, so, you know, Nick talked a little bit about, you know, going virtual reality, maybe augmented reality for some, maybe it's still... Chromebooks for others, right? So the, the idea of this being adapted to based whatever the learning style is is kind of important. It's it's the same across not just education, but it's across all users. Right? We we one of our earliest experiences, we were doing some work uh, down in California, and and we built this really cool visualization where a map was on the floor, and uh, you had route guidance of, of where resources were, and then you had other visualizations in the sky around you. And the idea was that you could walk the map and see where people were moving, and you could click this and see, you know, who they knew and, and, and what potentially they were carrying. And you could see all those really cool things. And the idea in virtual reality is they walk and grab things and, and, and move things around because you have this big, huge area to walk around. So then we went out to look at what the users were doing. They were in an operation center where they were shoulder to shoulder, 30 people in a 20 by 20 foot area. Right? No one's gonna walk around and club each other with re remotes, right? So we had to change the experience to, rather than moving around, you're actually sitting, and rather than moving your hands around, you're actually clicking and just moving small movements like this, as opposed to being just big grandiose ideas. But understanding you know, that, that environment and the user is kind of really what these experiences are about. I don't have a ton of experience with that. I suspect that we're seeing the best of breed of what's available now. There's probably research that's going on that's getting better, and I'm sure it'll advance quickly. 
especially given that these devices are becoming pretty popular. Um, but it's a, it's a really hard problem. Um, yeah, so I mean, I know it'll continue to move along, but very challenging for sure. So a little bit of what you asked is like almost technology forecasting. That's, that's hard. <laughs> right, that's really hard. I mean, way back, you know, the beta versus VHS, right? Which one did I buy? The wrong one. Because I couldn't forecast the right direction. I went with the best model, not the cheapest. Right? And so that, those kind of decisions are, are we're, we're in an environment where technology is moving so fast, right? That the next Amazon Echo is, is going to blow this one away, I believe. But it may not, right? I'm starting to see uh, where Amazon and Microsoft are partnering with Ford. Right? And now it's becoming part of an automotive kit. Right? It's going to have to get better if it's going to control my radio while I drive, or it's going to control my navigation while I drive. If it doesn't get better, it's going to cause some serious problems. Right? And people ask the same questions about automation. Right? When is the next Google car going to come out, or the iCar, so that I don't have to drive? Who knows, right? I mean, there's so much infrastructure that has to change in order for that type of thing to happen. The same thing with audio, right? It's so much infrastructure has to change. All right, if, you, if you've got audio and it's just one person talking to it, it's great. But if you've got an entire classroom talking at once, it doesn't work. Uh, just a comment yeah. on this, an anecdote. When I was reading one of these articles I was just describing, it talked about um, voice recognition stuff and how mass data handling is, is improving on it. And it occurred to me, you know, every time you talk to a service representative, if you can finally get through to them, you always go through the re recording that says, this conversation may be recorded for training purposes. And I'm thinking, oh, this conversation is being used to make a machine smarter, so a machine can do that person's job eventually. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's part of what the advancement of technology does, right? Yeah. Let's, let's get the routine, tedious tasks that humans don't like to do, get technology to do it, get the humans good at what they are good at doing, where they're being innovative and creative, and, and they're looking at things in ways that computers can't. Skynet. It's not Skynet. <laughs> Don't make me cringe. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so the, the question, and I'm going to sort of put it into terms here. So human in the loop versus on the loop, right? When a human's on the loop, it's just receiving information that a computer's automating at me, right? In the loop is the human is actually playing a role and steering the computer in terms of what it wants or, or teaching the computer new things, right? It goes towards what I was talking about where let the computer do things that are repetitive and known, especially in the visualization, right? Things that I know I'm looking for are known, right? Our analysts have these huge strings that they hand down from, from one generation to the next, which is these, these, I mean, they're literally two page longs, this, not this, this, and this, or this, right? So there's these big, long strings. And one analyst receives it from the one before. And what he does is, as he's doing these questions, he adds more to that string because a new task is given to him. Right? That string is automation. Right? And what that enables is now that the user can just tell me what's known and allow me to focus on the unknown. Right? Look for things that I don't already know to look for. That's where the human really plays a role. Eventually, automation may get there, but that's more Skynet. I guess one of the things I find is that with uh, some of the tools we build, we need that human. They've still got really good judgment. Uh, they're really good at recognizing things that are novel and interesting and follow some new unexpected pattern. You know it when you see it, 
and so we're really good at that, machines aren't. Uh, but as soon as you, you find it, that novel new thing the first time, then you can, you, you can usually pass that off to automation after that. But luckily there's lots of unique new things to find, so we'll, we'll be busy for a while. <laughs> the other funny thing about the human is that what we know isn't necessarily all digital, right? In terms of what's in the library, library of Congress, yeah, that's in there, right? But, but everything that I know or have learned over my entire life, computers don't know, right? When I work with DHS and I work with first responders, a lot of the decisions they make is based on wetware, their mind, and what decisions they've made over the last 20 years, right? You can't train systems to be in those experiences and to handle those harder decisions that they've learned from because they have that 20 years of experience. AI is still really, really young. It's not even a, a toddler right now. I mean, it's barely a baby. My other part was just because of my generation, and also because I don't understand computer science that well. But I'm trying to understand still the greediness of your packets coming in and what what you get from the 3D as opposed to just kind of having everything come in. You've got it's something a computer could do really well. The colors are coming as they come in, they go on an assembly line, and then they go out according to little sorter boxes, you know, so they could put triangles. Um, yeah, so the goal wasn't to make you a router. The goal was to teach you what a router does. All right, so routers are going to do what they do. I mean, they, they, they receive packets and they move packets where they're supposed to be and they put packets together and they protect them. They can put firewalls and we can do all kinds of crazy stuff on routers. I'm not going to ask a human to be a router because we've already trained the computer to do it better than we can. But we're not trying to teach a middle we, school we kid. We absolutely are trying to make it fun. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to teach a middle school kid what so the fact what a router does. Like gaming and turning around. And that <laughs> exactly. Is why you yeah, yeah. It, it, it partially is meant to be fun, engaging, uh, interactive, and we hope that kids will learn from that experience. You know, it's more of an experiential learning. They are learning about a completely automated piece of computer hardware a router in this case, through sort of this metaphor of moving boxes on conveyor belts. Oh, I forgot. So, and I'll say we'll do one or two more questions, that way we can grab more people down to actually experience the, the, the VR headsets, and then you guys can continue to have conversations with your guys. Um, but we have some good discussions now, so I'll be just wondering you. Yeah. That makes me wonder to what extent gamification is also part of your user experience and thought process. <laughs> I love that question. Uh, so the question was, what what extent is what extent is gamification part of the user experience process? Uh, so user experience, people like myself, we we focus on utility, usability, and desirability. And the desirability is really about the gamification. Right? One of the reasons why tablets are so easy to use is because they are so human-like and they're almost game-like. The fact that I touch and it interacts exactly like I do when I'm playing with toys on a, on a blanket as a two-year-old. Right? That gamification, if I can make my visualizations not just answer questions, but make me not want to put them down, make me want to keep working for eight hours doing my analytic tasks, that's a win. Right. If I can make it so that I don't have that cognitive overload where crap, that's too much information, right? that's a win. So that utility and usability in combination with desirability ends up being a little bit of a gamification. You don't want to lie. You don't want your visualizations to lie. You don't want an increase of bias because you made it fun. But you do want to encourage people to use the tool. We have one more. Otherwise, I would invite everybody to Uh, so the question is, is there any uh, VR apps for language learning? Um, it's not something I've looked into and I follow the field and I haven't really seen anything like that, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's out there. Uh, there are certainly a lot of collaborative apps 
uh, virtual reality based sort of chat rooms and things, and you know you could certainly uh, interact with people from across the world and you know hear their voice in real time. So not a structured way of learning other languages, but you can uh, go talk to people in whatever language you want. Okay, so I think at this time I do want to say thank you.